Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Now when it comes to movie news, late Friday afternoon has become something of a dumping ground for awkward movie news. I'm talking about a press release that a studio knows it has to put out, but they also know it's slightly embarrassing and that the fans are not going to like. So the reason they do it late Friday afternoon is that's the end of the news cycle for the week and everyone's going home. The media is going home so they can't quite cover it as they would if they had been released during the week. And even the readers are going home. They won't be at their desks or tied to their phones all day. Uh, they're going to be doing their own things as you do on the weekend. So it really gives this time for the story either to die out or for damage control. Uh, usually it's just for the story to die out. But with Marvel, who found themselves in this position uh, on late Friday afternoon, very different for them. Marvel usually is not in this situation. They've actually done an extraordinary amount of damage control over the week weekend here for their Edgar Wright no longer is directing Ant-Man's story. Now I mentioned Warner Brothers. Now Warner Brothers has the perfect example of a story that came out on a late Friday afternoon that they knew was awkward and embarrassing. And that's pushing Batman vs Superman back to 2016. It came out also late Friday afternoon, January 17th was that fateful day. Uh, and they got it in at the last moment. And the story, you know, there was nothing really to, for them to work on damage control because it is what it, it is. It was what it was. It is what it is. Um, Batman vs Superman is coming out in 2016. That's when it's going to be ready. There's really not anything else to say. But Marvel is almost in a worse situation because uh, this is something that could haunt them potentially uh, going into the convention season. That's something a lot of uh, websites have been saying, I think correctly so, that they're going to get asked about this. People are going to say, why did you dump Edgar Wright, who is a huge fanboy favorite. Uh, so it's very interesting. We'll get to that in a, in a moment. But I just think, first off, the biggest thing to discuss here uh, right away off the bat is that Marvel suddenly finds itself in Warner Brothers' shoes. Warner Brothers is used to this. They're used to being questioned, and I think they've developed kind of a bravado about it, where they're like, yeah, that's right, we're doing it. Get ready. You're either going to love it or you hate it. You're going to either love it or hate it, but you're going to have an intense reaction, which is what we want. And I think that uh, to some degree, that's a brilliant move on their part. So uh, they're used to this. This is, you know, this is business as usual for Warner Brothers at this point. But I think for Marvel, this is scary for them because they have really cultivated, they've developed um, this reputation as being fan friendly, the studio that gets it right, the only studio where the comic book people are in charge of the movies. Kevin Feige, comic book movie mastermind, Disney, hands off, and all those things seem to be uh, called into question with this story. All right, so the story that broke on Friday, we'll talk about the initial story and how it's kind of how Marvel's been working damage control over the weekend. So late Friday, all of a sudden, boom, Edgar Wright no longer directing Ant-Man. Uh, as I think Marvel expected, the fan base is very upset and shocked. I think they haven't even gotten to the anger point yet. It's just shocking. And of course, because you're talking about a film that's been in development since 2006 when Edgar Wright signed on for it. So eight years he's been working on this movie. Uh, it's finally about to go into production. He's cast it, um, and all of a sudden he's off. And they're saying it's not going to miss its release date. And apparently, and you know, when Marvel made the announcement, they said a new director will be announced shortly. So they're not wasting any time, uh, and they're not going to let Edgar Wright you know, put a monkey wrench in their very well-crafted, meticulous plans. Now, who quit? Was it? They said in the press release it was creative differences. So that's how Marvel put it out there. They said creative differences, or we're parting ways, the film's not been delayed at all, it's going to move ahead as forward with a new director, stay tuned. So everybody jumped on this story, and I think the initial reaction was how horrible for Edgar Wright. He's been kicked off of this film. Uh, as I said, eight years. Everyone was very excited for his vision. How could this have happened? Because my initial reaction, I had two. First, I was like, how can there be sudden differences in your creative visions when you've been talking about this for eight years? Did Edgar Wright just wake up one morning and say, you know what, I want to go in a totally different direction? And Marvel was like, no, thank you. I think it's much more likely it was the opposite case, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. My other reaction was, sadly, there goes Edgar Wright's career in Hollywood. I think he'll always be able to work in the UK. He always will have his uh, cult fan base and he'll always be able to work with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. But after uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world, failed to perform at every level as a movie, as a Hollywood film, uh, and is often still to this day cited as an example of hype that didn't materialize at the box office, right up there were snakes on a plane, and now to be not working on this film anymore, whether it was by choice or kicked off, either way, to be dumped like this, I think, who else is going to want to, to 
to get on that train, on the, on the Edgar Wright train. I would be very wary of him at this point as a studio executive. So, and I think that's just really unfortunate because I think this was the chance, I think we all viewed this as the point where Edgar Wright would jump to the mainstream, where he would become, he would finally prove that he could, you know, play with the big, play in the big leagues as a big Hollywood director. And now that's not going to materialize. So, uh, tragic news, I think, from a business perspective for uh, Wright. It could make him a martyr, uh, a fanboy martyr, which I think Marvel is worried about, which, which is why you've seen the damage control over the weekend, which I'll get to in a moment. That could be the way that it goes. That that's, might be what they're worried about in uh, convention appearances, that everyone's like, why did you do this to Edgar Wright? But I, I personally feel to some degree that they might have been you know, right to take Edgar Wright off of the project. And I'll, let me get to that first. So as I was trying to think about it, I thought to myself, why would they do this? What could be the, possibly be the problem? And I thought to myself, you know what? I bet it's Guardians of the Galaxy. Marvel might have been looking at that and said, you know what? We already have our gamble, our quirky comedy. Uh, we don't need another one. We don't need Ant-Man to be in the same vein. So even though Edgar Wright was there first and has been developing Ant-Man far longer than James Gunn was developing Guardians of the Galaxy or even part of the Marvel family, uh, James Gunn beat him to theaters. So I think that that, that's it's a tonal problem that they just don't want two of that type of movie they want guardians of the galaxy to be their quirky adventure team and everybody else more in line with the mainstream marvel films uh marvel is so prolific they can start to have mainstream and niche films in their uh in their universe which i think is fascinating on its own so i think that uh, edgar wright's vision was a casualty of james gunn's getting there first uh, and i also think this raises questions what this means for the cast paul rudd signed on to make an edgar wright ant-man movie of course he's still signed on uh but you know this is a cast that wright put together together. Uh, Michael Douglas, Evangeline Lilly as well. I think it's a great cast. Uh, and I would have been curious to see what Edgar Wright could do, because I thought that in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, his action sequences were some of the best parts of the movie, and he was surprisingly adept at handling a uh, special effects action sequence. And of course, he came up with great ideas about how Ant-Man would change size mid-kick or mid-punch to increase the velocity, you know, and the, um, you know how, how good a fighter he was. And that was brilliant. I was really looking forward to that. But I did have some question uh, as to whether or not Wright could make a mainstream film. And at the end of the day, it looks like that's what Disney had a problem with as well, because the story started to to develop where the rumor was was that um, Marvel wanted script changes and so they they came in and they said uh, hey Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish we love your script but we're gonna have some of our in-house guys take a crack at it uh, but we still want you to direct it so they're like okay we'll be good team players then the script comes back they don't like it and they quit and apparently the changes can't be made. Kevin Feige's hands are tied. The rumor is because this is uh, coming from higher up. Which and the, what's what's higher up than Kevin Feige? Disney. So that's how the rumor is shaping up that Edgar Wright is a casualty, the first Marvel casualty of the Disney Marvel relationship of the Disney machine, uh, which is a scary thought because that didn't seem to be the case. It seemed that while Warner Brothers suits have really their hands deep into the DC Cinematic Universe, that Disney was pretty much letting you know backing off and saying Kevin Feige work your magic. But again, I have to say as a Disney executive, I would pick up the phone and say, Hey, Kevin Feige, two quirky movies, James Gunn and Edgar Wright. I want you to make this a little bit more mainstream. I, and also, I'm looking at Scott Pilgrim's, you know, box office again. I'm looking at the end of the, you know, World's End. Uh, I'm looking at Edgar Wright's track record overall. I'm nervous. So I can see what, I can kind of understand what the situation that's happening here. Uh, and I think it's really just unfortunate. And that's what Marvel would like you to walk away with. It's just an unfortunate situation. And that's kind of what they were having, I think, going on. Because it must, I think it must have been, in, um, must have been coordinated with Marvel because you had both Joss Whedon and James Gunn speak out about the Edgar Wright situation over the weekend. I think to put a spin on the story. Because when everybody, sure enough, is covering it as the week begins, uh, they have to take this into account. Now, of course, Joss Whedon did a very touching, you know, uh, hailed up a Cornetto cone, you know, the rapper, like from the Cornetto trilogy, you know, in solidarity with Edgar Wright. Uh, that by itself might be a little controversial. You might be thinking, oh, wow, or Joss Whedon, you know, are you kind of like siding with Wright against Marvel? Uh, you know, I think Whedon is certainly powerful enough to do that. But then when James Gunn chimed in, I started to feel it was, a, a, you know, marching orders from Feige and a higher, the higher on up, uh, higher, on, higher on ups to tell them to kind of create the spin. Because James Gunn, uh, of course, got himself into quite a bit of trouble uh, months earlier with, a, with his internet postings, uh, went back to the internet and he uh, said something about how it was like a divorce and that he's friends with both Edgar Wright and Marvel and it just wasn't a fit and, you know, uh, he hopes everybody can move forward and just understand that it was all just a, you know, an unfortunate situation where nobody was at fault. 
And that's the spin he tried to put on it. And I think because I feel that James Gunn is kind of responsible for Edgar Wright being fired because of the tone, uh, you know, two, two similar tones, uh, and because he got in so much trouble with his first Facebook posting, and the fact that his movie hasn't come out yet, he hasn't delivered yet for Marvel, so, you know, you'd think, why would he risk his standing with the studio by weighing in here? I think he must have gotten the approval from Kevin Feige and company and Disney to weigh in. So I think that's how the story's taking shape. I think it's very unfortunate for Edgar Wright. I think it's at the very least a black eye, if not slitting his throat in Hollywood. Uh, I don't know if he can recover, and I'm very curious to see if Ant-Man can recover. And I wonder if this is going to, if this story will go away. Is Joss Whedon and James Gunn, uh, are, are their statements enough to kind of quiet this, or are you not going to let this go? When you go to Comic-Con and you see Marvel at these panels, are you going to ask them about this? Or are you going to wait to see who they, who, you know, do you have enough faith in Marvel that they made the right decision? This was necessary. All right, so that's the first story of the day. As for the second story of the day, it comes from Can. Actually, both the second and third stories of the day come from Can, which, of course, just wrapped up over the weekend. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is Quentin Tarantino, who has become quite the master of making headlines these days. Although I think he has to be careful because his manipulation behind the scenes actually might be showing. I think that he's starting to seem a little disingenuous in his headlines, because there's always an asterisk. Now, of course, he made huge headlines with the leak of his script for The Hateful Eight. And as the story progressed, you know, at first he was angry, then he was suing Gawker, then he wasn't going to make the movie, then he accused Bruce Dern's uh, agents over at CAA of, uh, you know, being the ones who leaked the script. Then he did a, a reading where he charged, you know, charged quite a bit of money. Uh, of course, some of it went to a good cause. Uh, and then, of course, he said, you know what? This went so well at the reading, maybe I will make it as a movie. And it just started to seem like the whole thing was just a way to get some buzz for The Hateful Eight. Uh, so you're like, all right, Tarantino, well played. You got me. But then I think he kind of did the same thing over uh, at Cannes uh, last week, at the end of the week. Uh, so it started to be like, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And I, th I don't think Tarantino wants to get in that situation. So what was it? Well, the big headline, of course, as I'm sure you saw, was, oh, Django Unchained miniseries on television. Uh, and I, of course, was also piqued by that headline. I was like, I love Django Unchained. I love television miniseries. I'd love to see these two crazy kids get together. And that was Tarantino's thinking. He even said in his interview, people love miniseries these days. Why not do that with Django Unchained? But then there was fine print. He didn't want to make a new story about Django Unchained. He wanted to take the 90 minutes left that he had cut out of the film, Wow, by the way, um, I hope you know, I don't even think he shoots on video, so that's just an incredible expense of you know money and time. But anyway, he wanted to put the 90 minutes back into the movie, creating about a four-hour film, and then he wanted to chop it up into chapters and air that the director's cut almost. And I don't think we've ever seen a director's cut go to television, you know, as a miniseries. And so I think Tarantino's reasoning, though, was who wants to sit through four hours? And by the way, I don't want to sit through four hours if it's going to turn out like Kill Bill. First half of the film, brilliant. Second half, not so great. Uh, I don't care if you chop them in two. Uh, it just, the quality's not there. So I think that Tarantino maybe does need to edit. And I don't know, you know, thinking back to Kill Bill, do I want to sit down for, you know, unedited Tarantino? Uh, and I think I've, if you've ever seen Tarantino's, uh, you know, interviews, particularly uh, he did a very famous one on The Tonight Show where he had a little bit too much to drink in the green room, uh, Tarantino unedited isn't as fun as you would think it would be. It's more just kind of a little sad and, you know, uh, meandering. But so I think that it's very misleading of Tarantino to get this Django Unchained miniseries headline and then be like, well, I'm just actually going to show you my unedited film. Uh, I was really hoping that it would maybe be a television series the way Fargo, for instance, has gone to film over on, I mean, from film to television on FX quite successfully, in my opinion. So I think the story is interesting in that I would like to see Django Unchained uh, as a miniseries, but I don't want to see Tarantino's unedited film as the miniseries. I want to see something new and fresh. Uh, that was what I would be interested in. You know, I think that we've been talking a lot, and also when The Lone Ranger came out last year, uh, you know, um, the, you know, of course, the news that, that The Lone Ranger might have been based on a very famous African-American, U.S. Marshal. A fascinating story, by the way. Where, I think his name is Bass, Bass something. Um, oh, I don't know it off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but you should look it up because it's a great story, and I don't know why it's not a Hollywood movie. It's brilliant. Uh, and so I think a Western showcasing, you know, the African-American cowboys would be a great idea. And I think it would be very interesting, uh, you know, to, to have that whole perspective and how the transition from slavery to the West, you know, you know, going West for opportunity and that being one of the circumstances that you would do it. I think that's a great idea. And, uh, you know, for instance, Bell is a film that's out in theaters. I'm going to try and review it this week. But I think that 
the entertainment uh, industry correcting, you know, the whitewashing of history, you know, uh, the, you know, people being like, oh, I didn't know that there were people of color in this setting, in this setting, in this setting. And they're like, there were. History just erased them from it. So to put them back in, I think, would be a really worthy and entertaining and fascinating uh, endeavor. So Django Unchained miniseries, yes. Quentin Tarantino's misleading headlines, no. So what do you think? What do you think of the Django Unchained miniseries idea? And what do you think of Tarantino? Do you still believe his headlines? Are you getting a little wary of his, you know, asterisks and fine print? Uh, or do you think it's all part of the game and he's playing it well? All right, so that's the second story of the day. The third story, also about Can, as I said, was, uh, you know, we had the winners come out over the weekend and some very interesting developments. Now, the, the big winner, the Palme d'Or, was Turkey's Winter Sleep. So expect to see that uh, as an Oscar contender in best foreign, the best foreign film category. And there were a lot of other, there were a surprising number of foreign films that, you know, uh, got the, uh, went home with awards. But for the American films that kind of stood out, or the UK films, the ones that will be the very, you know, English language, will be very strong contenders at this award season, were surprising. Now, of course, uh, the biggest surprise, I think, uh, well, actually, the, mo the surprise you'll have heard about is that Bennett Miller, the director of Foxcatcher, won Best Director. And we just talked about the Foxcatcher trailer. It just came out. Uh, very exciting opportunity for both Steve Carell and Channing Tatum. Mark Ruffalo, he's, you know, he's been in this awards game before, but it's new territory for Tatum and Carroll. Uh, and Bennett Miller, of course, has also been here with Moneyball and Capote. And this is a great thing for him to get this nod, and it really uh, increases the chances that Foxcatcher is an awards contender this uh, coming awards season. Of course, Nebraska did very well at Cannes last year, and look at how well that did. It didn't really walk away with anything, but it got a slew of nominations and a lot of recognition. So that's very exciting for Foxcatcher. I think it really not only increases the chances of Bennett Miller in the film, but also helps Channing Tatum if we're going to maybe see him uh, do the awards circuit for the first time. That'll be really interesting to watch. So Foxcatcher. Maybe it's a good thing they waited a year because, and people are saying the film was re-edited, it was fixed, and now it's much more competitive. So uh, that's fascinating to see Grace of Monaco wait a year and fail at, at Cannes and Foxcatcher wait a year and succeed at Cannes. All right, so who won the Best Actor and Actress category? Let's start with Actress, Julianne Moore. Also a strong awards contender. She's not, this isn't, a, the, new, the scene's not new to her, but she's been away for a while. Uh, but for her role in David Cronenberg's Maps to the Stars, uh, she got the Best Actress uh, Award at, at Cannes. And now that's a, this is a dark Hollywood comedy, of, and she plays a, an aging, uh, very successful actress and kind of the problems she has to deal with both personally and professionally. Uh, but and, uh, just like uh, Channing Tatum is going to benefit from Foxcatcher's attention at Cannes, uh, Robert Pattinson is in Maps to the Stars. Of course, this is his second time with Cronenberg uh, after Cosmopolis, so that's very interesting. And also you have um, Mia Wasikowska is in this film. So, so, so is John Cusack. But, you know, you have a very strong, interesting, and eclectic group of actors who will also, I think, be pulled along with Julianne Moore's recognition. So that's very exciting for, for that film. Now, this is the biggest news to come out of this. Timothy Spall, a.k.a. Wormtail from the Harry Potter franchise, and I'm sure you've seen a number of other places, he's never been a leading man or a big star, he won Best Actor for Mr. Turner to the Mike Lee film, Mike Lee. And I think that's absolutely fascinating development. And it's just another example, uh, and I think that's why I think this is very strong uh, going into award season, because the Academy loves this. Where you have an actor, like for instance, like let's think Melissa Leo, for instance, um, you know, you have an actor who's worked their whole life. Uh, um, June Squibb was a big uh, recipient of this kind of sentiment as well last year. We have an actor who's worked long and steady, been a good soldier for Hollywood, and finally late in their career gets that recognition. It's a Cinderella story for every member of SAG out there who's part of the like 95, 99% who have trouble even making a living. So I think that's very exciting for Timothy Spall. The film also, this will get a lot of attention for this movie. It looks really good. He's kind of like the Scrooge of artists, uh, but uh, he plays uh, Mr. Turner, uh, J.M.W. Turner, Turner, I believe, very famous uh, British artist. And this kind of artist, this historical uh, landscape painter, he's the one who elevated landscape painting, uh, apparently, from, you know, just... Uh, a style of art to a, you know, a uh, highly acclaimed style of art, of painting. Uh, you rarely see that kind of attention. It's usually just directed, you know, in the entertainment industry towards the modern artists and such. Uh, or, the, you know, the bold, you know, uh, the bold artists like Frida Kahlo. Uh, but to see uh, a classic artist like this get attention, I think, is very exciting. Uh, so, Timothy Spall, Best Actor, uh, and I think you should definitely look for this uh, movie. I'll try to review the trailer this week. It's, it's fascinating development, as I said, and also uh, what's very interesting is that Turner was known as the painter of light long before Thomas Kincaid, and he kind of was uh, a predecessor to Thomas Kincaid. Of course, although Thomas Kincaid is a very 
you know, was, unfortunately passed away, was a very commercial mainstream artist, whereas uh, Turner had, you know, the acclaim of the artistic community during his lifetime. So fascinating choice for a movie and some interesting choices coming out of Cannes, which I think will affect award season. All right, so on to the viewer question. This comes from Tom Wood 555 and Tom says, Hey Grace, love the show. Have an interesting question. I agree, Tom. That's why I picked it today. And Tom says, The other day I had to literally explain to my dad what an Easter egg is uh, in a movie nowadays. And it got me thinking, is an Easter egg a vital part of a movie to allude to an expansive universe or a cheap gimmick to get an audience hyped for a sequel? Great question. As you said, Tom, you were right. Your instincts were right. It's a good question and I've picked it for today. Uh, I think it's very interesting to see fanboy terminology cross over into the mainstream. Easter egg, as you said, now your dad knows what it is. And then also when I went to see X-Men Days of Future Past for the second time, the first time was a press screening, the second time there were a bunch of people in the theater and almost everybody knew to stick around for the after credit sequence, which in this case was at the very end, after the very end credits. Uh, you know, it wasn't after just the first initial round. So that really is a commitment. And the people who were staying weren't just your fanboys, but your mainstream moviegoers seemed to also be in the know. They knew they had to stick around. They wanted to see it as well. They weren't like, well, I know something's coming, but I want to go home. I don't care. They, we, Hollywood has managed to capture the attention uh, or bring out the inner fanboy of the mainstream moviegoer, which I think is fascinating. So I think that's a great development. But as to your specific um, question as to Easter eggs, I think they can and cannot work. I think that they can go both ways. Just like anything, it can be abused or well used. Now a great uh, example of well use is actually Man of Steel. Now there was a rumor that there was going to be a headline about Steve Trevor being lost, you know, Air Force pilot. And I thought that was a great idea. I wish they had done that actually. That's a great Easter egg. But another Easter egg in the film they did use, which I think is effective, is for instance the inclusion of the Wayne Tech logo and the LexCorp logos. Uh, they weren't, weren't really coming into play in this first story here, but you saw that they were a part of Metropolis. Uh, of that world. And I think it was a great little nod to what was coming. And that's what's crucial. An Easter egg needs to only be there if it's alluding to something that's coming. Uh, and I think a good example of bad Easter eggs, uh, I think ironically, even though X-Men is back on track this weekend with Days of Future Past, is the older X-Men movies. And even the ones that Brian Singer directed. For instance, I thought the Easter eggs in X2, when Mystique goes to take those files off of the computer and we see a bunch of files, for instance, one was named after Franklin Richards, I believe, etc. They never did anything with that. They never, you know, Franklin Richards was never even introduced over in the Fantastic Four movies. Now, of course, obviously those didn't work out. That might have put aside or delayed plans that they had to maybe introduce Franklin Richards. But I don't want to see Easter eggs for the sake of Easter eggs. If you're not teasing something that's coming down the line, don't waste my time. So I think that's my my definition of what makes a good Easter egg versus a, you know, a cheap Easter egg, as you said, a cheap gimmick. So that's my opinion on that. I'd be curious to know what you guys think. What makes a good Easter egg is just its existence alone enough, or do you want it to lead to something eventually? Uh, and then also, what do you think of uh, mainstream moviegoers understanding the fanboy terminology? Have you had anyone ask you for a definition and for sticking around for the after credit sequences? All right, thank you for tuning in to today's morning movie news. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any stories, I mean, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.